Um, actually, the, the first thing is, how do you pronounce Xi? That's kind of what I've settled on. <laughs> Everybody has a different idea, but um, that's, that's excellent. So yes, I'm Rafe Levina. I'm at Google. Um, this is actually my 20% project. This is not an official Google product. And to the extent that I express opinions, it, it, those are my own and not of Google. Um, so, so let me show you a little bit, like, you know, uh, just give, jump in and, and do a little bit of, of a demonstration. So one of the things that I do a lot is that I open a lot of extremely large files. So this file is 380 megabytes. And it loaded pretty fast. I actually want to get that even faster uh, by loading asynchronously, but um, uh, that's, that's not the way it works right now. It's a synch synchronous load. So it took, took about maybe a second, maybe a little bit more. And then as I scroll through that, you know, I'm, I'm getting like complete 60 frames a second, just butter smooth scrolling. That's the goal of this editor, is extreme performance. So let's talk uh, a little bit about uh, you know, what, what is the shape of this project overall? It's, it's hosts on GitHub, it's under an Apache 2 license, it's completely, you know, it's, it's not just open source, but like really kind of community-based open source project. I started it a little bit more than six months ago and uh, took it public, you know, I was kind of doing it um, just on my own for a couple of months, took it public uh, in late April. The code base is uh, in a couple of different uh, pieces. There's almost 10,000 lines of Rust code, which is the core, and then a bunch of libraries, and the libraries potentially have interest you know, outside this project. Uh, and especially there's this rope library, which is the string representation. I'll talk about a lot more detail later. And that's almost half of the code. Uh, it's all in stable Rust, uh, completely safe, zero uses of unsafe in the code. And uh, I thought uh, the earlier talk was really interesting about the use of traits. The ratio of traits is actually pretty high compared with some of the other. Uh, I, I, I do use traits extensively, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. There's also 1,200 lines of Swift code in this project, which is the Coco front end. It's a Mac, um, uh, it's a Mac app, although the intent is I want to see more front ends. I want to see lots of different uh, platforms that this runs on. So it's my 20% project. Uh, open to the community. Uh, there have been 27 contributors so far, and uh, I'm hoping that there will be a, a, a little step function, uh, hopefully as a result of this uh, talk. So the, the, the goal of this editor, as I kind of open up, is performance. And how am I achieving performance? There's a bunch of different ways you do that. So the, the most obvious is use a fast language. Uh, hmm, hmm, Rust. Um, and then, you know, I wanted to do it in a more modern, uh, you know, I, I really want to use kind of the, the best known techniques of doing all of these text editing primitives. And, you know, if you look back 20, 30 years ago when people were kind of building these tools, uh, multi-core parallelism doesn't really exist. You don't really try and use that to solve problems. So I haven't done a lot yet, but I want the architecture to support, do as much work in parallel as possible. Where where I think things get even more interesting is to use the most advanced data structures and the most advanced algorithms for manipulating text. So the, the data structure is ropes, and as far as algorithms, the most important thing to do is do as little work as possible. So when you do an edit, you do an incremental computation of only updating just a few tiny things around that edit, get that on the screen, and don't like recompute things. But I think one of the things that makes Xi most unlike previous editor projects is using asynchrony as a core defining principle. There are other projects, certainly it's inspired by NeoVim, which, um, which tries to do that, but I think I've taken it a little bit farther. So the goal is to never block on slow operations. So this is a little bit of a, of a picture of the way the, the editor is designed. It's in separate, it's in lots of different modules. So it's really like a microservices architecture. And so this core at the center of it is a small server. And then there's a front end which is bound to your um, GUI platform. Uh, but the core, it doesn't, it, it's just sitting there, you know, responding to requests and then the core owns the state of truth of the document. So if you open a very large file that's in memory in the core, 
And the front end is only looking at a tiny window, only what's on the screen. So the core, does, the, the uh, front end doesn't have to deal with like scaling to very large documents. And then another part of this architecture is that a lot of the things that you, um, that you wanna do, the plugins, those are in separate processes. And again, kind of uh, wired together with this microservices style, uh, style architecture. So I'm gonna walk through what happens when you press A. What, how does that actually end up in, a, in an edit on the screen? Um, and kind of how, how does this flow through this architecture? So you start with a, a Coco event, uh, insert text A, and that happens obviously on the front end. And that turns into a JSON. So these, this is just pipes. This is just, the, uh, the core is just listening on standard in. And you see this JSON RPC message. I'm showing kind of a simplified version of the JSON RPC, but it's, it's still pretty simple. Uh, so it's an edit request and insert, and the string that you want to insert is A. So that immediately is reflected in the document as a change to the document, which is a change, in this case, just to the string of the document. And the next thing that happens is that the core now dispatches, and this happens kind of, this part in parallel. It's sending out a bunch of different messages to different other things that are subscribing to those changes to that document. So it sends, first of all, an update to the view and said display, uh, it sends to the front end, display these lines which are representing uh, the view of what's on the screen. It's also sending to the plugin, the syntax plugin, um, very fine-grained information that says this, this edit changed, uh, this the edit happened uh, to the document, and you know, where and what changed and why, because sometimes the plugin will care about that. So the view is now updated, uh, and then the syntax plugin has had a little bit more time to think about what color should that really be, and it sends a JSON message back to the core that has these syntax highlighting spans. So the core then basically updates its state, which contains both the string and these style spans, and also dispatches to the front end another JSON RPC that says, okay, the screen, what's the view that's on the screen has changed a little bit, and then the front end displays that. So that's kind of step by step what happens in this, in this architecture. So a little, a little bit about the front end. I wanted to kind of explore the most modern ways of writing, you know, all these kind of apps. And so the front end is written in Swift. I wanted, even though a goal is for this to work on lots of different platforms, I did not want to use a cross-platform GUI library because I feel there's always some way in which it does not really look like a modern app, you know, like a native app, and it doesn't really feel like a native app. So it's like for each of these platforms, I'm writing a fully native front end. And the, um, the front end contains all of the logic that is specific to that particular platform, to that particular uh, GUI. Uh, and another you know, way that I'm achieving performance is that it's really only holding a tiny amount of state. So uh, a, a lot of those things that happen, things bog down when you have just a tremendous amount of state in memory don't happen here. And the, the architecture is designed so that UI event loop is almost never blocking on anything. It's always available to take a keyboard or mouse event. So when you do this asynchronous stuff, you know, just saying, oh, things can be happening here and they can be happening there at the same time causes problems that if you have you know, an edit that is being proposed by your uh, plugin, either to do syntax coloring or things like inserting indentation, if you're typing at the same time, you get two edits that really conflict with each other, and, or potentially conflict with each other. And there's a, a lot of literature on how do you resolve that? How do you resolve really concurrent edits that are happening from different sources? And usually, people think of operational transformation in the context of a network collaborative editor, and you know, that's, that's a direction this could go, because the engine for computing the operational transformation is pretty powerful, it's pretty general. But I'm really focusing on just solve the problems of concurrent edits that are happening because of a keyboard, a plugin, you know, all in the same machine. So 
So you definitely, you, you, can get these, um, you can get these cases where things are happening concurrently. What you do, you take that edit and you transform it. You say, in order for that edit to make sense in the new state of the document, I have to transform it slightly. You know, they inserted the character here, so I'm just gonna take this and adjust it so that it now fits in the new state of the document. So I'm gonna write more about this. Uh, you'll hear more about it. I, I'd love to go into more detail here, but lots of stuff to cover. It's a, kind of a hybrid of uh, traditional operational transformation and these conflict-free repli conflict replicated data types, which is kind of a newer uh, model. Um, and um, uh, as I say, I think, I think there's potential for this to go a little bit deeper into collaborative editing. And another function of operational transform is to handle this kind of, when you do undo, that's also kind of a nonlinear time travel. And you can get into the same kind of conflict problems, you can get into the same things where when you do an undo, are you really restoring to a consistent state to what you had before? So another piece of the implementation is this rope data structure. So what is a rope? A rope is basically a balanced tree where each of the leaves is holding some piece of the string. So the size of the leaves is bounded and the branching is bounded, which means that pretty much any editing operation that you wanna do is gonna be log n in the worst case in the size of the buffer. If you look at something like a gapped buffer, if you're editing with a lot of locality, you'll have you know, O1, but if you do something that kind of um, you know, has to move that gap, that can be ON. So you have a thing where your average case is maybe pretty good, but your worst case can get really bad. One of the advantages of rope is your worst case is always, is always log in. So in this case, you can see the, you know, like in the nodes, I'm storing the size, I'm storing the number of, of bytes uh, of string um, of, of the children. So the implementation of this in REST, I think here's an area where the goals of Xi and the capabilities of REST as a language really mesh beautifully. That the tree, there's a generic tree implementation and that's parameterized through traits. So there's a leaf trait and a node info trait and you can plug those in, in, in uh, right now I have three completely different specializations for different ways in which I'm representing sequences and I'm representing computations that I wanna do on sequences and I think this is gonna expand. I think I'm gonna use it to store like incremental syntax highlighting state. So I'm storing the string, I'm storing the line breaks, and I'm storing the rich text annotations in three different specializations of, of this trait. So the theory behind it is, um, you know, it, it, you really can represent any monoid homomorphism. I'll talk about that a little bit more in case people don't know what that is. Um, another, way in which like the capabilities of Rust fit the needs um, really closely is that the, the API gives you this immutable data structure. So ropes really became popular uh, in purely functional programming languages. Because if you have like a string buffer and you just want to append to the end of that string buffer, in a purely functional programming language you can't do that. And if you had to copy the whole string, your performance would be just terrible. So that really uh, pushed people towards this rope data structure. So you have this tree, and yes, you have to build up a new tree, but you only have to allocate O log N nodes. Um, and that's good. But in Rust, you can do even better. If you just wanna mutate one of these ropes, and uh, you happen to be the only one holding a reference to that, then you can, there's this um, get mute method of this um, arc reference counted container uh, that lets you just get that reference and do that mutation. And the type system guarantees that um, everybody else is going to see an immutable copy. So if, if somebody else was holding a reference to that rope, it would make the copy and you would not be changing the state out from somebody. So if you were to implement this in a language like C++, you'd get the performance, but we're doing a lot of kind of aggressive things here. We're doing a lot of things that in, you know, if I were re reviewing C++ code, I'd say, this is too dangerous. This is too risky. Too much can go wrong. And in, in Rust, you get this guarantee from the type system that is immutable, but you're not being held to that allocate everything. So you get the performance. 
So what is a monoid homomorphism? Um, a monoid is a binary operator, really, that has the associative property and the identity problem. That's pretty abstract. So, so what are some good examples of monoids? Uh, a string is a classic monoid. And so the, the binary operation is just string concatenation, and your identity is the empty string. Uh, another example is uh, integers, and then your, your binary operation is addition, and your identity, operate, your identity element is zero. So it's pretty obvious that these things, um, you know, uh, both hold the, both respect the, the monoid properties. So then, what is the homomorphism? Well, a homomorphism is a function from one monoid to another. So a really good example is, let's go from strings to integers, where that function is the length of the string. So they're both monoids, and the, this function, this string length function, is preserving the, the, uh, the binary operator in a way that, like, if you, if you do a computation on one side, that's accurately reflected on the other side. So when you go back to, the, to this picture of this tree, then the leaves are storing the M monoid, and the nodes are storing the N. So you know, you're, you're not replicating those leaves, but at every point in the tree, you know what that length is. And this is generalized to you know, anything that you want to compute that fits within the monoid homomorphism framework. And there's a few things. Like right now, the main focus is on counting new lines. And so that gives you, um, you know, if you're storing both the string length and the new line, uh, count, then you can do a traversal of that tree that's still, you know, log n that will give you a correspondence. Like, where am I? What is the offset within this file for a given line? And vice versa. And there's, there's actually a lot of other interesting things you can do in this framework. And won't go into lots of detail now, but I think this is going to power, you know, some of the um, kind of impressive performance improvements that I, that I hope to do. So another algorithm that is really important to get right, really important to get fast in an editor is uh, word wrap. And one of the things that I have done in Xi is very aggressively making this um, incremental. So we'll go back to the we'll go back to the um, to the file here, and I'll do word wrap uh, first of all as a bulk operation, uh, and that that'll take a little bit of time, but not too bad. And now that I'm here, uh, you know, as I type. This line is actually more than a megabyte long. And it is not, like in almost any editor, you'd, you'd just rewrap the whole line. I mean, how else would you do that? But there's actually a more sophisticated, you can actually see down here, um, it says that I've, I've touched 140 bytes when I did that, and it took 0 0.01 milliseconds, which is pretty fast. Um, <laughs> so how do I do that? Uh, I, I start the incremental, uh, 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 word wrap process at the line before the given edit because you, you know you can like you it's possible for it to affect the line before the one where the cursor but it can't affect anything earlier than that and it keeps going until you're able to sort of resynchronize with the uh, previous state that you had so it actually you know a lot of times it converges um, pretty quickly so the result of line of uh, wrapping uh, word wrapping uh, is stored in a line break data structure, which is just another specialization of the uh, uh, rope, of the underlying rope. So this is just storing line breaks. Um, and the, as I said, that initial uh, word wrap, it's currently synchronous. You have to do it on the whole buffer before um, it responds again. But uh, I'm, you know, I, I want to make that asynchronous uh, really soon. And the design, I think, supports that. It's just a little bit more tricky coding. So many editors do plugins by kind of exposing bindings to a scripting language in the same process as the editor. So you basically get these uh, data structures that get exposed of buffer and selection and cursor and so on and so forth. And in Xi, I've decided to do it in a pretty radically different way. And so this is really microservices. And it's really the Unix philosophy. It's really you know, taking modules and wiring them together so that each module gets to focus on doing one thing. For example, syntax highlighting. Um, so these, these plugins communicate over uh, a pipe uh, with JSON RPC. 
And there's a buffer protocol where you know the, the plugin is maintaining a, a window into the into the um, file. So if the file is really small, it's just storing a copy. But if the file is really big, it might store like a one megabyte window. And then if you have to do a lot of processing on that, then you'll do RPCs back and forth to get access to that. And so this is working today. I can actually uh, demo this again. Um, I'll open a, I'll open one of the files. Oops. Uh, didn't mean to do that. Uh, this one. And then again, I'll I'll make that a little bit bigger. Why is this not? Oh, there it is. Uh, make that a little bit bigger so you can see it. And then I'll do the syntax highlighting. And then you know, as I type, uh, you don't see. Let's see. Mm. Ha! I said I wouldn't do live coding, and here we go. Uh, should probably give that a name. Um, with it, if we had a syntax analysis plugin, then it would have given me an error message there, but uh, not yet. Um, so this is working, and you know it's it's incremental, and um, you know it's it's using this operational transformation. So if the syntax highlighting were really slow, and I continue typing, then it would all be valid, and then it would eventually catch up. Like the the model of CRDT is really eventual consistency. So the idea is, you know, when you stop typing, eventually the thing will converge to the to the true answer. So this is inspired, this idea that you can have things talking to each other is inspired. There's a few efforts out there, including the Microsoft language server, the one that's used uh, in TypeScript. And I'm, I'm actually hoping to support that protocol directly, as well as the, you know, kind of more specialized protocol that I've built just for communication with um, things like syntax highlighting and indentation and so on. So the syntax highlighting module that you just saw there, this is based on Tristan Hume's uh, Syntect library. So it's, it's you know, really a general purpose library and you know, I've kind of just layered on the bindings to make it talk over this JSON RPC protocol. And it's using, it's, it's a regex based uh, approach. It's compatible with Sublime Text, it just it can consume the Sublime uh, syntax rules. Uh, the way it's implemented internally is it's using the uh, Onig bindings to the Onigaruma uh, library, which is the regex library from uh, Ruby. Um, I have implemented a Rust-based uh, wrapper around the Burnt Sushi regex crate, uh, because you do need to support things like back references and context and stuff like that. It's not quite ready yet, but it's an interesting possibility to take this whole thing to uh, Rust only, so there's no C uh, bindings uh, in there at all, and uh, hopefully, like uh, better performance because um, the Burnt Sushi Regex crate uses really kind of intelligent, uh, finite state machine uh, techniques to get even faster uh, Regex handling. Uh, so it's pretty fast. It's not the fastest syntax highlighting uh, in the world, but it is a lot faster than the ones that are just written in JavaScript that you see uh, people use. So. One of the motivations for making plugins is, you know, I was looking at this is like, should plugin, should syntax highlighting work just be something that's in the core natively supported, or should it be out there in these plugins? And one reason I want it in plugins is I don't think that's, that regex-based highlighting is the is the future. I don't think that's what I want to do in an ideal world, because if I just lex the language and had a kind of a loose grammar for it that understood like when am I in a type, when am I not in a type, when am I just in an expression, then you'd be able to do things like look at an angle bracket and say, well, is this a bracket or is this a comparison operation? And so I think that has a potential to be both faster and more accurate, just strictly better across the, the board. And um, I'm kind of excited about the potential of having a syntax highlighting module be used in context other than just driving syntax highlighting of, of Xi Editor. So let me show you kind of, you know, how would that work? Like, what would you do? So let's build the highlighting plugin. It'll take a little while to compile, no problem. And then um, I'll go and I'll just run it. Uh, it it's, now it's listening on standard in. Uh, so then I will um, open up my RPCs. Um, and I'll take a little bit of JSON, and what this JSON says is I'm gonna initialize a new buffer, and the uh, size of that buffer is gonna be 16 bytes. And so it says, uh, an RPC that says, oh, give me the data um, for that buffer, and uh, with a maximum size of one megabyte. So if that was a huge file, it would, it would be saying, you know, give me the first megabyte of that file. So okay, fine, sure, pub fin main, good. 
and it says, here are your color spans. And so um, then, you know, if I want to say, oh, edit that, uh, you know, make that, uh, you know, start a comment, you know, after that, then I just send another RPC that says, uh, edit, insert, here's where you're editing, here's the text that you're adding. And so, sure, here's your new color spans. So it feels to me like a lot of things could potentially be talking to this plugin. And, you know, you, you, it could be a really kind of uh, general service. And as we get, like, higher quality and higher performance, I think it could be a very valuable library. And, like, people that need syntax highlighting uh, as a service, um, you know, makes sense. Shas, you heard it here first. And, you know, given, like, where Rust is going, like, you could even imagine compiling this to Wasm using Inscripten and running the whole thing in, in a, uh, deploying the whole thing to the web. So the RPC, how does this work? So it's based on JSON RPC, and this is one of the most controversial. Like the first, you know, I say this is based on JSON. People say, why JSON? That's slow, so inefficient, so slow. It's actually not inefficient. Um, JSON implementations tend to get optimized like crazy. So if you were just defining a binary protocol and you just started writing code, that would probably be slower than the actual CERDA JSON, which has been through a tremendous amount of uh, evolution and, and optimization. And anytime you're writing a plugin and you're like, oh, I have to do this RPC layer, well, doing it in JSON, that's very easy. I mean, you talk about batteries included. This is a AA battery, not a CR123A, right? Um, so, uh, the, the current code um, is, is uh, using threads. And like, so there's this thing where you're blocking on input and you actually want to be a little bit more sophisticated, especially in the syntax highlighting plugin that uh, you know, you, you, you're thinking, and if somebody presses a key, you get an, uh, an edit event that comes in. You actually want to interrupt. You're, you're doing this in chunks. You don't want to do it a line at a time. But if you see an event coming in, you want to be sensitive to that. And so there's like a method that says, you know, is there a request pending? And then you pull that like really, you know, every time you actually do a line. And the way that's implemented is that there's a separate thread that's blocking on input and it sends a message over a channel to the thread that's actually computing your syntax highlighting. And then it's using arc mutex all over the state. Every, you know, that uh, anytime you need access to some piece of data, then you, you, do, uh, you go through an arc mutex to get that. And uh, that's not the future. <laughs> this is the future. Um, that I really would love to replace this with uh, using the futures library, which we, we just saw, and that would have some pretty significant advantages, that, this, that moving, just moving an object from one thread to another thread and crossing the Linux syscall, syscall barrier to do that is between five and 10 microseconds. And so by doing it with futures, you actually are gonna save that uh, overhead altogether. And another thing that I'd like to do is you know, this idea of a future, this idea of saying, okay, here's you know, a request to do something, and I'm not ready with the answer yet because maybe it's an RPC over here or maybe it's a slow computation. The right model is, here's the request, the result is a future with the result. And that, that I'm, I think, can be kind of a, a metaphor. Right now, this is kind of coded by hand, but I think that can be an organizing metaphor for this. And I think I wanna refactor it in such a way that the Zycor can be more embeddable in other apps uh, and not necessarily even dependent on JSON RPC. That just becomes a detail. So switching gears a little bit, another component of Xi is this Unicode library. And right now the main thing that's in there is this line breaking algorithm. So UAX 14 has all the rules about like if you have a combining character, then that's not a line break, but if you have a space, it is. And you know, it's, it's actually, you know, emoji has a whole set of rules. It's very complicated. And uh, you know, the industry standard implementation of this thing is ICU. You see that almost everywhere. And of course, I wanted to do it my own way. And so I built a kind of, it's, at the heart of it, it's a state machine that it, you know, you character, it just runs through the string, uh, character comes in, what Unicode class is it, advance the state machine by one state, and then it says either this is or is not uh, a line break opportunity. And uh, it, the, the implementation turns out to be three times faster than ICU because I've just you know, focused relentlessly on the core. What does this thing really need to do? And the API is designed to support that incremental. So it's um, the incremental breaking. So you know, obviously you get a, an iterator. It's a very natural, very clean uh, interface so that you only run it as far as you need to. Um, and then uh, you, know, you initialize it with some state, which might be in the middle of a line, 
and just run it only as much as you need. And so I'm hoping to do more with Zyunicode. There's a bunch of interesting problems that need to get solved. Uh, I think the most interesting of these is the case insensitive find. And um, this is actually kind of where it touches in to the uh, uh, homomorphism stuff. That if you're doing case insensitivity for completely arbitrary languages, that's a really tough algorithm. Uh, you know, you, because there's these case transforms and there's you know, different normalization forms. 90% of the time, especially when you're dealing with a really big like, dump of something, like you know, that ninja file that I opened before, it's ASCII. So I'm, I'm hoping to use the homomorphism to say uh, like a sort of a difficulty level and say ASCII is the simplest difficulty level and then there's more that might tell you, oh, you have to use these more complex, more expensive algorithms to do case transformation. So when you're doing search, you know, you're going over the tree, you say, for this whole subtree, I can just use this really, really fast, you know, uh, just run over bytes and, you know, and with 20, um, or with not 20, I guess, uh, to do the case transformation. And then if, if it's, you know, if it's a complex language that needs more complicated case transform rules, then you say, okay, go, go the slow path. Uh, and I want to make sure all this stuff that's in Xi Unicode, like some of this kind of makes more sense to be, I mean, there's some Unicode functions in the Rust standard libraries, although I think the kind of the tradition now is you put things like this in a crate uh, rather than the, the Rust lang, you know, core crates and Unicode RS. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm talking to the people there and I want to make sure that like the stuff that makes sense to go in there, the imp improvements go in there. And, and that really, you know, brings us to this whole question of community involvement. This has actually been one of the more gratifying things of working on this project, that within a week, uh, when I put this on GitHub, I got two prototype front ends that worked. Uh, a, um, uh, I think that was the GL and the Windows-based ones, and those are kind of coming along. Uh, and then the syntax highlighting pro, I was getting, going pretty far down the line of writing syntax highlighting myself, and Tristan Hume kind of came up with this syntax library, and it's like, uh, you know, hey, it's done. That's awesome. And so I have 27 contributors uh, total, um, you know, with lots of different features and fixes and improvements and lots of really great discussions that go on on the uh, GitHub uh, issue tracker as well. And in the process of doing this, you know, like, Sergey Jason didn't uh, escape control codes correctly, so uh, that was really cool interaction, you know, like, here's a fix and a little discussion, is this the best way, is this going to regress performance, and, and then that got merged. Um, you know, some of the like Unicode property lookup, you know, I use tries, that's faster than uh, binary search, so pull request to Rustlang to get the Unicode property lookup faster. And then the line breaker, like, it was really good timing because, you know, Servo had this thing that was just looking at spaces, it didn't really use, do the Unicode rules right, and I was like, hey, do you need this? And they're like, yeah, this would be great. And so, again, getting that integrated into Servo happened within, I think, like a week or two. Of, of, the, um, of the project even going up to GitHub at all. Uh, so, you know, I really enjoyed, you know, being part of the Rust community. So, I hope we have some time. I think we do, maybe, a little bit for questions. Uh, let's see. You can take one question. Ah. <laughs> so we're, all, we're actually a little bit over time already, but oh, so well, I'll, give, I'll give you one question. One question. So, you get to pick who that is. Since you're the <laughs> oh my gosh, I think your hand went up first. All right. All right, now I'm nervous because <laughs> they might have had better questions. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually really curious about the, uh, your scrolling of the 300 meg file. Uh, what it, what it, can you just, just describe the protocol to actually like, yeah. scroll and, and refresh? Is that like a deltas? Are you shipping deltas back and forth? Or what? Um, so that's actually interesting. I, I was debating whether, whether to have a slide for that. So as you scroll, so the thing is that the core is maintaining state of where that scroll region is. So when you're not scrolling, if you update it, it sends like that screen full of information. Uh, so it's at most one screen full of information. Um, as you scroll, obviously you've got state that lives in the core that doesn't live in the front end. So it sends, at that point, that's like one of the few synchronous RPCs in the system. And it says, you know, give me the give me the view, the rendered view, so it's got all the line breaks and, syntax and uh, style spans in there. Give me the rendered view for this region, and then that's an RPC that come, goes out, and it comes back as JSON lines with spans, 
and gets displayed. And then I've, uh, I won't show it, there's like debug information. That's almost always less than one millisecond uh, round trip uh, to, to make that RPC happen. So even though it is synchronous, you know, it's not slowing down the, the scrolling process. So the, the head of the scroll is actually sending the entire You're sending the screen full of information, which is not that much. Oh, like I showed on like two lines. Oh, no, there's a, it's a window. I mean, it's a, it, it's, there's like a. Right, so I've got like 40 lines in my screen. Yeah. Uh, no, it's it's more it's more sophisticated. It's it's like a delta of what you actually need. Yeah, and it's chunked, so it's not you don't do it every line. It's like every screenful. Awesome. Thank you so much. The talk was really great. Thank you.